Welcome to another special episode of the Dark Parade. My name is Bo, and I'm a found footage fool. <laughs> Tell me the camera thing isn't annoying. Yeah, it's annoying. Hey, everybody. Welcome back uh, to Found Footage Fool. Uh, this time, a special episode. This is something that, that sprang forth from the, the chat and Discord uh, at, at some point. And uh, I blame Jason Gray in particular and, and exclusively for this. But what, for, somehow or another, we got on the subject of slender man stuff and i don't even know how that happened but i was saying you know i need to take a tour of these slender man found footage movies and what i learned is uh and please correct me if i'm wrong ladies and gentlemen but i don't believe there are a ton out there at least not as many as i thought and a lot of it's web series and you know who has the time right um so i've got three movies Two of which are found footage films. One strains that categorization, but we'll get to that. So let's start with what is, I think, considered the best of the bunch. So we'll start with the good stuff first this time. And that is a movie called Always Watching, a Marble Hornet story. And I'm going to display a little bit of ignorance because... I never watched the Marble Hornets Hornet stuff on YouTube. I had heard about it, but it was it just wasn't one of those things that I I you know invested time into, and I feel like I should because I think the movie is kind of interesting. Um, but more than that, before we get into that, um, I think the whole phenomenon of Slender Man is interesting because it's sort of a crowdsourced monster and for those of you who don't know the slender man came from some kind of creepypasta challenge uh to manipulate a photo you know just to make something scary and so a guy made uh this slender man character put uh the the figure in the background of uh, a black and white picture of with a bunch of children in it and then there was another picture that got doctored and it was good enough. I mean, it's a good picture and it's kind of a creepy idea and it's vague enough that you can uh, project onto it you, pretty much anything that you want. And it's genuinely unsettling. And as a result, uh, because it is so vague, Slender Man becomes this thing that we can use as a cipher for whatever it is that we want to use it for. And it's up to these movies that we're going to discuss to sort of create the mythos around it. And because you're at ground zero of creating a monster, so you can kind of do anything with it. There are some vague uh, notions about, well, it has something to do with children. And there is uh, like the, the sense of if you look at it, that kind of um, alerts it to your presence. And, of course, it found its way into Minecraft with Enderman and all that kind of thing. So, I it, it, it's an interesting phenomenon to create a, an urban legend, whole cloth, and then have pop culture kind of pick it up because Slender Man has become kind of ubiquitous. I, you don't see a whole lot of Slender Man media right now, but I think that's largely due to the murders and the sense that there's kind of a tastelessness to capitalizing on you know the slender man mythology when it led to a very real uh, attack <laughs> but that hasn't stopped everyone but anyway so with always watching like i said i'm not familiar with the the youtube stuff the original marble hornet series which my understanding is that's sort of the best representation of the slender man stuff but always watching at least get some mythology down and the idea is uh it's a, a film crew like a news crew going around um to uh try to gin up a story and in 
their search for a story, they're following a guy who does um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, recovery work for places that have been foreclosed. And, you know, knocks on the door, opens it up. And he kind of warns them, like, "Eh, a lot of these, a lot of times we go to these places, they're really run down. And, uh, you know, it's just a dump. But one of the houses they go into that's that's being foreclosed upon is this really, really nice house that's still furnished. And there's dust over everything, but there's, like, food laid out on the table. And it almost has that Roanoke, Croatoan kind of vibe to it. And it's like, well, what happened here? And so they start to dig into it and find some home videotapes. And as they dig through the tapes, they realize that this figure is appearing the slender man figure this you know uh you know slim tall besuited figure that has no face and you know that it's spooky because the editing goes all jittery and snowy when you start to focus on slender man and there's a a mark that that appears on people that resembles something like the symbol of the Zodiac almost, only it's it, it's kind of tilted. But it's like an X with a circle uh, surrounding the center of the X. And uh, when that happens, it means you have been targeted by the Slender Man, who apparently also has some possession powers and can make you go crazy and do shit you didn't want to do, in, including murder families and, and whatnot. And so, um, you know, that is... Essentially, it, it 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 doesn't totally define what Slenderman is, where he comes from, what he wants. It's just, hey, here's this strange figure, and keeps it suitably vague, you know, as befitting um, the the source material. And so, um, when it comes to this kind of movie, however. We are not just reviewing a movie. We are applying some science here. And nothing says science like Slender Man. That's the shirt I'm wearing right now. Nothing says science like Slender Man. And we want to apply this criteria to this movie and see if it's a good found footage movie in addition to being a good Slender Man movie. And I would argue it's a it's a pretty okay Slender Man movie. Um, you know, it doesn't really take any chances but maybe you don't need it to and maybe at the time that it was produced it was a little more cutting edge or a little more uh defining uh as as a film but when i watched it the other day it was just like oh okay this has got some better than average acting and whatnot but let's get into this so um number one is there a good reason to keep the camera on and that's uh, where the movie does a fine job because this is all about, you know, a camera crew looking for a story and the story kind of finds them. And so as they're filming this stuff, um, they're discovering, you know, more and more about the Slender Man and about what he can do. And um, there's weird time law stuff. But yeah, I mean, regardless, there's a pretty good reason to have the camera running all the time. And also, there's an added bit of, oh, you can only see the Slender Man through the camera. So that's an even uh, bigger reason to keep the camera on, right? So all of that stuff works pretty well. And then you get into characters. And the characters are kind of fine. When it starts, there's almost this love triangle going on between... Uh, the characters of Sarah and Milo and Charlie and Milo is kind of the cameraman. Uh, Charlie is the new, um, you know, hotshot guy that's trying to get this story on the air. And Sarah is the reporter played by Alexandra Breckenridge, who is probably best known from being in like Walking Dead and American Horror Story and uh, stuff like that. So um, she is uh, yeah, sort of the option our object of everyone's affection in the movie uh, up to and in, and until things really start to go south uh, as they realize like, Oh, they're all targeted by uh, this, this slender man figure called the operator. Interestingly enough, 
um, in in this movie. And I've heard, uh, I think the rake was one I heard. Um, the the operator, of course, and yeah, a couple of different uh, references, not just Slender Man, but but um, different ways to refer to this character. And, um, so, uh, the keeping the camera on is fine. The character, the characters I think are interesting enough. Uh, th- it starts better than it ends because it's, at a certain point it just descends into horror movie tropes and you, it stops being about these characters and they're just, you know, struggling to survive and whatnot. Although you do get a nice turn from, um, w- the Milo character, the camera operator who, at a certain point realizes like, oh, we're kind of fucked. So I'm going to try to do this thing that's going to save our life. And maybe that will work. Maybe it won't. But regardless, uh, he at least uh, makes an attempt. So I do like that part of it. Um, but, you know, for the most part, uh, I, once you get past the first act, the characters all kind of get thrown uh, by the wayside. Which, which again, is a real bummer because... Uh, th- you know, there's some moments where you think like, oh, this could be really good. And then it just goes a different direction. Um, then we get to authenticity within the context of this film. Is there a, a sense of believability? Can we buy that this is actually happening? And I'm going to say that, yes, mostly yes. This is, uh, uh, you know, it, it has enough um like lore that it's presenting to be interesting without ever getting completely wrapped up in said lore and uh, you know it doesn't go up its own ass <laughs> about that which is is good news and yeah i i think for the most part it works um once you get like i think the the whole thing with the the camera going wonky Every time the Slender Man's around, I've always felt like that's kind of a cheat. But what are you going to do, right? Like, that's just... Eh, that's part of the lore of the Slender Man now. It, it's going to happen in this movie. It happens in the next movie. So, what are you going to do? You can't uh, can't change uh, what the Slender Man is according to, uh, you know, the mythos set forth in the current day. Um, but... Uh, I think for the most part, it, it it has an internal logic and it mostly works. And then you get to watchability. Is this a watchable movie? And I would say for the most part that it is. Uh, there are some moments that lag as they do in these kinds of movies. But there's also this sense of discovery. The biggest problem I have with the movie is there's a point where they're going to track down this family. They believe they've, they've found... Uh, the survivors or the the family um, whose house they went into that set all of this off. And uh, so they go on a road trip to go find said family. And when they get there, it's kind of a a, a real anti-climax because it, it kind of turns out to be nothing. You know, it does lead to the, the denouement of the film, but it still feels really... Uh, you know, like a, a big letdown when you've kind of built up to this. This was the essential mystery of the movie. And you do get some closure. You get some answers as to what happened. But it's not very satisfying. And I think it really bends the movie more towards a mediocre film as opposed to something that I, I could really, you know, full-throatedly thro- recommend to you. But it's mostly watchable. I think that it, it can be occasionally disappointing and occasionally frustrating. But for the, the most part, it's a better than average made um, found footage movie. Like there's a little bit more technical uh, ability. The acting is a little bit better. So all of that stuff, I think, makes it a little more enjoyable. Um, and then we come to scares. Is the movie scary? And that's the big question, isn't it, ladies and jelly spoons? Is the, the movie scary? And not really. Um, It's interesting because I have an interest in Slender Man as this new age uh, monster and the mythology that's cropped up around it. But I don't think the movie ever really gets to a place where it's genuinely creepy. 
And it ought to, because the idea of this figure that is just kind of constantly lurking and you don't know what its motives are. And all you know is that once you're marked by it, you're kind of fucked. And there's no arguing with it. You know, there, there's no attempt in the movie to kind of confront the operator. Uh, who, by the way, played by Doug Jones in this movie, which is interesting. I'll, although it could have been played by anybody. It's it's really just a character that stands around for the most part. Um, but it's, yeah, it's okay. Uh you know, I don't think Always Watching is a great movie. Uh, I've yet to see a really great Slender Man movie, but I think it's at least interesting as a bit of cultural, like sociological note. Um, but as far as a scary movie, you know, eh, kinda. Um, so let's move on to our second of uh, these three movies. With Always Watching being the best, we take a step down with the movie Slender, uh, which is directed by Joel Petrie of uh, Slender fame. Also did um, a lot of special effects, visual effects for uh, seemingly rather low-budget movies and television series. But at any rate, Slender is a startlingly... Startlingly? Start abdominal, abdominal, ad- abominable, uh, a a startlingly similar kind of movie, except that it's cheaper in almost every way. Where a would be documentary crew is searching for a subject for their film, and one of the guys in this documentary filmmaking crew sees a woman on a train who is uh, complaining about the fact that there is this creature or something what took her kids. And he decides that he wants to track her down and make a documentary about her. And the idea is is kind of a real asshole idea. But it's, hey, we're going to confront this woman uh, with these missing children and we're going, you know, she thought that it was some monster that took the kids away. And so instead, we're going to sort of shock her into reality. We're going to set up this situation where she is going to be allowed to believe that this thing is real. And then we're going to pull the mask off and show, oh, by the way, this was just nonsense. Like we, we were just leaning into your delusion. And aren't we all uh, better off for you having come around to it's real. Are, instead of believing that a monster took your kids. And so there's a little bit of business with themes about um, how, you know, ambitious filmmakers can exploit or, you know, young people trying to do something can exploit uh, people who are vulnerable, whether it's mentally or whatever, for their own sake. And that's one of the things going on here. But of course, you know, there's a, a real Slender Man. But here's the thing. I don't know that we ever see the actual Slender Man in this movie. And and there's a fake one. And then there's some stuff that happens off camera. Um, But that's kind of it. So let's give it the old scientific treatment and see what we got. Um, Keeping the camera on. uh, Can we justify keeping the camera on? And that is a big old fat yes. Um, The idea that they are a documentary crew um it makes this all work i think all of that is fine um and it and it you know is it great uh all the time in terms of of consistently giving us good reasons like it starts off in a way that i kind of liked where the cameraman is in a bar and getting thrown out because he's recording one of the other patrons and which sort of sets the stage for him being a dick who likes to film in places uh, that perhaps you shouldn't. And, uh, but at a certain point also it, the fact that we're just shooting on, you know, cheap handheld stuff, it only goes so far. And I know that this is more about keeping the camera on, but I'm also going to bend this into, you know, sometimes the video looks cheap and sometimes that's okay. But 
maybe it's just coming off the the heels of uh, always watching, which looks pretty good for a found footage movie. And this looked just so cheap. Uh, it was it was real headache inducing. Um, and then you talk about the characters. Like I said, most of the characters in this are, are real dicks and unpleasant to watch and be around. Uh, the closest you get is the guy working as a bartender. I think his name is Dan. And Dan at least has a bit of a conscience and is like, I don't think we should be doing this, but ultimately goes along with it. So kind of, you know, you're, you're talking out both sides of your mouth. Uh, and so there's no one to really root for other than this poor woman who's lost her kids, who's only in the movie for, you know, five, 10 minutes and, and is not a primary character. She's, you know, just around the edges of the film. So the characters are, generally unlikable and generally pretty bad then you get to authenticity does this feel authentic and no not really because it's a cheap enough movie that the acting is not great and see uh, especially with the 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 woman who they're taking advantage of she is particularly not good even though her character is the most interesting character uh, she's not believable in this movie and that doesn't help anything when you're dealing with a found footage movie. Again, the whole idea is that, you know, the footage is found and these people are all real. and But it's it's not good. Um, so the authenticity is kind of down the toilet. And then watchability. Is this movie watchable? And this movie is incredibly dull. If there are moments that drag in always watching, Slender is all of that drag with about three minutes of interesting stuff at the end. And by interesting, I mean at least something is happening and and things are moving around and it's not just people talking at each other. But even then, you don't really see anything. And the one thing I will say for always watching is that it it gives you what you kind of want out of a found footage movie. There are pretty regular, you know, set piece scare moments. I don't know that they always work. But they at least exist. And Slender feels like a couple of guys had an idea and went out to make this movie. And it turns out the idea just wasn't a very good one. And which brings us to our last criteria, which is scares. Is this movie scary? And the answer to that is a, a hearty, fuck no, this movie is not scary. There is nothing scary about this movie. This scary, uh, this movie is just irritating. Um, I don't like this at all. I think that the best thing you can say about it is at least flirts with the idea of having a theme with, you know, the exploitation of, you know, mentally, uh, disabled people or, or, or mentally, uh, challenged people, uh, or, you know, people suffering from mental health issues. And that's kind of it. That's the only thing I, I could recommend, but that's not a recommendation. That's just saying, well, there's, I suppose, some merit because the message is don't be an asshole, even though the entire movie, you are just saddled with these two incredible assholes. So, yeah, it's not great. And, uh, and you know, as far as scares, no. Uh, like I said, it is completely unscary. It is uh, a bad, bad, bad movie. So, with Always Watching Under Our Belts and Slender Under Our Belts, I decided to turn to something that's not exactly found footage, but at least is in the wheelhouse. And because I'd watched these other two Slender Man movies, I wanted to watch the documentary Beware the Slender Man, which was a, an HBO documentary production. And I had only seen a little bit of it. And I was just curious to see what that looked like in light of having seen these two movies that were about the mythology of Slender Man, even though the second movie doesn't even really bother to get too deeply into that. Um, Beware the Slender Man was at least a way to sort of reconcile what I'd been watching in a fictional realm with what the real story was. And the documentary focuses almost entirely on the, the criminal case um, where Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire um, 
were two young girls and they, uh, you know, bought into this slender man thing and went and stabbed one of their friends, uh, a young girl named Bella invited her over for the night, you know, took her out the next day, took her out into the woods and stabbed her in the woods. And it was obviously just horrifying, right? Like that is, uh, one of the worst things that can happen. And, and both of the girls were, you know, 11 or 12 at the time. And the thing that the documentary is really about is whether or not, and the big question is, did they do it because they were malicious or did they do it because they were under the sway of this legend and mental illness blew that up into something that created this situation? Morgan Geyser um, is diagnosed as schizophrenic and, you know, has later said uh, since the crime that she uh, ha- had been having visions of, or, you know, auditory and visual hallucination hallucinations since she was about three years old. And so whether or not that is true, uh, you know, is, is sort of left up to the viewer. Although I think the movie is sort of leans towards, she is probably someone suffering from, uh, a mental illness and, and left undiagnosed and left untreated led to this, you know, horrible event. And then her friend, Anissa Weir wire, um, was just sort of along for the ride and, and was enough of a social misfit that she didn't want to lose her friend. And so went along with this, you know, it's that, was it fully a do that idea of the, of this kind of mutual hallucination that, uh, they, they both contribute to this shared psychosis and so that being the premise of, of the documentary, um, what I will say about it is it is terribly unfocused and does it, it makes a whole lot of points and makes a whole lot of nods towards here is what the real problem is kind of thing without ever landing on any firm ground with any of it. Like there's the suggestion that the problem is children being exposed to the internet at too young an age. And there's a recurring sub story going on with one of the fathers of, uh, one of the, the, the girls who committed the crime saying, you know, Hey, my kid is my other child, a, a young boy is being given an iPad. And if it were left up to me, we would not have an iPad in this house because that was one of the the things that contributed to this horrible thing that happened. But also I don't want my kid to be left behind. And that's kind of an interesting idea, right? Of, you know, can you trust uh, technology in the hands of children? Um, you know, even if we know that it can be harmful, but it can also be helpful. And, you know, where is that push pull? Where is the, the truth in, in that? What, what is the right thing to do? something I struggle with as well in a classroom um, where I have a lot of students who, you know, I don't allow them to use their phones, but they still have their laptops. And even though they're school laptops and there are certain things they, they can't do, they can still, you know, play fucking Fortnite and shit. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's tough, right? It's a battle that we're, we're coming to terms with that we're, we're living in a world where there's a generation coming up now that have never known a time before the internet and before these, you know, ubiquitous electronics devices that are there to always demand attention. And so what does that generation look like? And I can tell you, it's hard to teach them because they don't want to pay attention to shit because, you know, learning things like grammar does not give you the dopamine hits that seeing text messages or watching TikToks does. So that's an interesting idea. But to the, you know, back to the documentary, it doesn't go far enough with it. And it sets up the idea of Slender Man being, um, you know, this figure that we can kind of project almost anything onto and including these Pied Piper myths and and all of that, but also doesn't go far enough there either. And also focuses on the trial and the relationship between 
you know, th- these girls and their parents and, and makes nods towards the relationship they have, uh, the parents and, and children to the, you know, survivor and, and her family. But that also doesn't go as far as you want it to do. And it does all these things, but it doesn't do any of them really well. And it's, it's a very frustrating watch because there are so many interesting ideas going on in the story that you just want it to settle down and focus on one of these stories or perhaps just be longer, be, you know, one of those, you know, four hour documentaries as opposed to a a less than two hour documentary. So you have time to let all of those ideas breathe some and it just never gets there. And it's, it's very, very frustrating. Um, and she's done, you know, a number of other, uh, documentaries. She's a, a, a documentary filmmaker that has been working, continues to work. Um, you know, I'm sure that she has done fine work. I just think that Beware the Slender Man is a little bit of a misfire because it just, it just doesn't go nearly far enough. And that's, uh, that's unfortunate. So, um, I, look, if you have any recommendations for a good Slender Man movie, I am totally open to suggestions here. I do not have uh, a good one uh, in my library yet, or uh, at least in my catalog of movies that I've seen. So, please, 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 if you know of a good one, or one that's you know particularly bad, I'm interested in that too. But as of right now, uh, I cannot recommend any of the Slender Man movies, really. Even though I think it's a fascinating subject, and I really wish that I had, you know, more of uh, a, a library or like a, a resource, a well of movies to pull from that are about this. And, you know, let me know. And I never saw that non-found footage Slender Man movie either, so let me know if that's any good. Uh, but to let me know those things, be sure you go over to uh, facebook.com forward slash groups uh, forward slash the dark parade. Um, or you can go over to uh, legionpodcast.com and um, do, you know, search for the shows and find the dark parade. And you'll either place, you're going to find a link to the discord server. So uh, drop over there and uh, both say hello and also give me some recommendations about this Slender Man business. I'm, I'm curious. I want there to be a good Slender Man movie, and I don't know that there is one. And if you tell me I just need to watch the Marble Hornets thing, then maybe I'll do that. Um, but that's it. We'll be back uh, next week here in May. Goodness gracious, it's May already of 2023. We'll be back in uh, a week with a an episode of Heart of Horror with, with Kay Pollock. Got a, a few other things lined up. I am almost out of school, which means I should have some time to actually do some more, you know, fun kind of shows. And uh, and we'll see how that goes. Probably not. It, I'm probably lying to myself and to you uh, that I will have more free time than I, I expect I will. But at any rate, thanks so much for uh, listening to the show. Thanks for sharing the show whenever and however you can. Uh, and I will be back in just one week to continue more of these shenanigans. Uh, so uh, thanks, as always, for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time.